So you can call this uh, lecture the, uh, the end of Spanish exploration, French colonization, and the reintroduction of Spain into Texas. So uh, as we pick up our story today, the thing uh, we need to keep in mind is some of the overarching themes that are in, in Texas history. Number one, Texas, for the most part, is not going to be very valuable to uh, the Spanish, at least initially. The Spanish make claim on Texas in 1519. That is well, uh, well-trod well ground. Alonso de Pineda, and then, of course, New Spain has the possession of Texas. For a while, Texas is a part of the other Spanish uh, province of Coahuila, so Coahuila e Texas. It's true in the Mexican period as well. Uh, but the uh, Spanish, uh, they're going to start to develop, and the Spanish are going to start to uh, figure out how they want to, uh, to hold territory. So I guess that's really where I'm going to pick up and begin, and then I'll catch the French, and then we'll come back to the Spanish once more. Where I actually start today would not be in the 1600s, but with this big sweep of Spanish history, remembering Texas is claimed in 1519 and Texas is lost to Spain or Spain loses Texas in 1821. So essentially a 300-year window in Spanish uh, Texas history. So in the, but in Mexico, as we call Mexico, around the state of Zacatecas, let me spell Zacatecas to you. Uh, you need to put it in your notes. Give me a second here. Uh, but Z A C A T E C A S. Zacatecas is a major state in Mexico uh, in the 19th and, the, and earlier centuries. The reason Zacatecas is important to Mexico and by extension Spain is that Zacatecas is home to some very, very valuable and deep uh, silver mines. And so the, all that story about God, gold, and glory, the desire for color, meaning gold or silver, being brought back to the Spanish treasury, all that is fair game uh, out of Zacatecas. So the Spaniards are going to be very interested in holding Zacatecas. The problem for the Spaniards now, this would be about 1540 or so, the problem for the Spaniards all the way through the end of the 16th century in and around Zacatecas is an Indian tribe. Uh, this tribe is called the Chichi Mecca. Uh, Chichi uh, Mecca, C H I C H I M E C A, I believe. Let me spell that. So the Chichi Mecca, that Indian tribe is a fierce tribe. Uh, something akin, if you're familiar with Texas or, or uh, American uh, Native American tribes. Uh, the thing is, is that there's something akin to the Comanche in their fierceness. It was always said about the Comanche uh, that you had a fight on your hand when they came to brawl. It was certainly true about the Chichi Mecca. Uh, they were kind of a tribe that was uh, fiercely independent and basically took no allies, or to my knowledge, admittedly somewhat limited knowledge of the Chichi Mecca is they did not have many allies. Uh, to be fair, uh, the Aztecs could never subdue the Chichi Mecca, and the Spaniards took uh, uh, the Spaniards had a hard time subduing the Chichi Mecca as well. In fact, arguably the Spanish never did; they just wore them down and, and assimilated them. But the reason they were so noteworthy is is that they were very good bowmen. Uh, they they could uh, hit people at a hundred yards, sort of thing. That was impressive stuff. Uh, the uh, Chichi Mecca. Not only were that, they also, uh, they were, they could be really ruthless. Uh, they would paint themselves up, and last but not least, according to the Spanish and Aztec accounts back this up, is the Chichi Mecca uh, would strip down to their birthday suit and basically uh, go on the war path, as it were, uh, naked. And the uh, Spaniards said it was for the effect, and evidently it made an effect upon the Spanish because the Spanish did not drive them very well. So the reason we bring the Chichi Mecca up isn't just to talk about their uh, proclivities and war-making ability. It is to talk about those silver mines. Zacatecas is, uh, without me having looked at a map in a long time, somewhere about 80 to 100 miles north of Mexico City. Anyways, if you're going to be taking color, meaning gold and silver, back to Mexico City from those mines, you need to do so, and you need to make sure they're protected. Those... Uh, that's, that road from Zacatecas to Mexico City has to be protected from bandits, uh, from hostile Indians, in this case the Chichi Mecca or somebody else. The way they do it, and this is the important, really this is the maximally important aspect for Texas history, that is, is that it creates the Mission Presidio Complex System. The Mission Presidio Complex System. 
the Mission Presidio complex is in is in whole the way the Spanish are going to try to uh, hold Texas. The Mission Presidio complex, please put this in your notes, has three ex ways of uh, accomplishing its goals. Or rather, I should say a little differently, it has three goals to accomplish. Number one, it is designed to uh, hold territory for Spain. It is designed to make a physical footprint in a territory, whether it's Texas or Zacatecas or somewhere else, they have a physical footprint in Spain, or rather that Spain can have in a territory and say, this is ours and we hold it, and we hold it well. So that would be one. Number two, it is designed to civilize, uh, their terminology, it is designed to civilize and to Christianize the local Indian or Native American tribe. That they're, that they're directed toward. You'll see these missions, particularly the mission. This is an important concept, important uh, uh, distinction you need to know. The mission is directed toward the church. The mission is the church in this sense. And the church is trying for, on behalf of the Spanish crown, is trying to hold territory. This, the, and it is trying to turn these, these uh, Native Americans into good uh, Catholics good Christians, good civilized subjects. Number three. So number three would be this. You want them to take on uh, Spanish traits. You want them to assimilate into the larger Spanish culture, the dominant Spanish culture. You, so you're going to teach them language. You're going to teach them the Spanish language. You're also going to teach them Spanish farming and agricultural technique. And the third real major point is, is when you do that, you, the thinking is you're going to turn those Native Americans into good taxpayers. So if we talk about why do we care about the Mission Presidio complex system, because it is what's used in Texas, one, hold the land, two, turn the uh, natives into good Catholics and Spaniards, three, uh, get it, turn them into taxpayers. So you have a three-pronged uh, effect. Some areas and in some missions are more successful in this or that. It depends on the mission you're talking about. But that's right there, whether it's in Zacatecas or around San Antonio, Texas, as we know it today, or Goliad or Nacogdoches or uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, or anywhere in the Spanish uh, dominion of New Spain, that is the basic premise of the Mission Presidio complex. So the mission now is to this church. What is the Presidio? The Presidio goes to the military. Those uh, soldados, or excuse me, those friars, those padres, those priests, those Catholic priests are going to need some sort of protection. So the thing is, is that when we talk about the, this protection, uh, they need, need protection from bandits, uh, marauding uh, natives, or just simply the natives within the mission. So the Presidio will, uh, the idea of the Presidio is to protect the mission. Sometimes you'll see the, uh, the mission built very closely to the Presidio, frankly, sometimes not. So anyhow, all of which is to say you have the mission to the church, the presidio to the military, and the last part, put in your notes, the via, V-I-L-L-A, the town that is going to be associated with the mission presidio complex. The via is, uh, so an, an easy Texas example would the, be the via de Bejar, B-E-X-A-R, B-E-X-A-R. Actually, you would see it in Spanish, B-E-J-A-R, but for us, if you think of Bear County, that's what we're talking about, the via de Bejar or the Via de la Bahia, or Via de Goliad, excuse me. But anyways, all of which is to say is you have those three major components of the, the Mission Presidio Via setup. The Spanish are going to run their colonies in that way. Something else that arises in Mexico and translates into Texas uh, a century later is what's called the encomienda system. Encomienda in this, let me spell it for you. Give me a second to write this in. E-N-C-O-M-I-E-N-D-A. The encomienda system is the another method by which Spain is going to hold and to organize its territory. What the encomienda system is designed to do is to set up individual pure-blooded Spaniards. And that's a theme I'm going to raise from time to time with you this week, particularly, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I just looked over, let me pause. But the encomienda system is designed to put pure-blooded Spaniards in charge of Native Americans. Uh, really worth remembering that simple and important fact is, is that one of the things that you'll see far more, more with Spain and later Mexico is the issue of blood. Far more than you see in the United States, 
Uh, more especially, put this in your notes, you'll see me really hammer away at this uh, in the when I talk about Mexican history and the Mexican period of Texas history, you'll see the Spaniards. You'll see the Spaniards basically believe and practice that if you are born as a pure-blooded Spaniard, you fit a certain caste in Sp Mexican or Spanish society. If you are a mestizo, a mestizo would be that individual who is of mixed blood, say like uh, the child of La Malincha uh, and uh, Hernando Cortez. That child there, La Malincha and Hernando Cortez, would be a mestizo. They have some mixture of Spanish and Indian blood, that is the mestizo. Well, anyways, uh, and then last but not least is the Indian himself. You really, in Mexico and by extension Texas, are going to have a three-tier society. Pure-blooded Spaniards on the top. You are what you are born to be. Mestizo in the middle. And then down at the bottom, you can't see my hand as I dropped it, but down in the bottom, the Indians, or the Indios, as it uh, was called back in the day. The fact is, is that that's the st uh, strata society. And within those stratas are different uh, uh, facets. I'll talk more about that in a later lecture. But at the same time, when you say the encomienda system, those Spaniards, those pure-blooded Spaniards at the top are going to be put in charge of the Native Americans, the Indians, as they would say, or the Indios. They, when I say in charge, I don't want you thinking about like your boss at work. I want you to put this in your notes when you say uh, what type of in charge, how, how uh, much power do they have. These patrons, P-A-T-R-O-N, these patrons, these Spa pure-blooded Spaniards at the top, they have life and death control over their Native American uh, charges. The Patron is owed, so we're clear about this relationship. The Patron is owed by his, here's another phrase you may have heard over the years, that you're by a peon. Uh, this is, in a sense, the peonage system as well. You can hear it said that way. But the Patron is owned, owed by his uh, subjects, the people he controls, unquestioned, Un, uh, unchallenged uh, submission, and they owe allegiance to the Patron. They, the Indians, owe allegiance, total allegiance to the Patron. The Patron, in turn, this is the important, it's a two-way street now. The Patron, in turn, is going to owe to his subjects, to those who are under his care, his peons. He, he, will, be owe, or he will owe them a basic subsistence living, and Catholic or Christian education and conversion and, and spiritual needs. But it is a uh, master-servant relationship, and that uh, for the longest time was the labor system in Mexico to some degree or another. Uh, but that, that Patron Indian relationship, and even sometimes you'll see Mestizo get up this high in Texas, for example, and then down there, uh, it, it's, uh, it is a labor system in Mexico and by extension, Texas. Uh, it, here's a name for your notes. Uh, the guy's name is Placido Benavides. I'll talk more about that family when I talk about the impresarios of Texas. Placido Benavides was a son of Martin, son-in-law, excuse me, of Martin de Leon of, of what we'll call Victoria. Uh, many of you are familiar with the town of Victoria, Texas, the county of Victoria, Texas. Uh, that is uh, where the where the Benavides uh, was, where he was he was uh, married into the De Leon family. There's uh, he would be an example of a patron. The Mar Martin De Leon would be an example of that same patron system. Anyways, all which is to say that all comes to Texas when the Spanish start settling. But the Spanish, after the the Hernando de Soto expedition, the Coronado expedition, and even one uh, failed uh, water landing that uh, turned into a disaster on the Texas coast in about 1545 or 50. The Spanish come to the conclusion after, say, 1550 for your notes. Let's just use a round year for your notes. After 1550, the Spanish come to the conclusion there is nothing of value in Texas. The Spanish are not going to relinquish their claim. The Spanish are not going to walk away from Texas in the sense that they're going to say it's open territory, take it for what you want. They don't do that. However, for the better part of 100, almost 150 years, at least 135 you could say, but for the longest period of time, uh, for over a century easily, the Spanish have no real interest in Texas. And so Texas history in a sense can just wither on the vine. 
you have some activities out in the west, uh, out around El Paso and uh, Santa Fe, and uh, you can bring all that in. And in fact, I, I'm, I'm tempted to do so right now. In fact, I'll just go ahead and tell you this story. Uh, Maria Coronel. Maria Coronel. That's a, a name you probably ought to put in your notes. Maria Coronel. Maria Coronel never steps foot in Texas. Never does. And the thing about Maria Coronel, and there's an article in Beyond Myths and Legends about her. Uh, probably what I'm about to tell you next probably depends on your view of religion and uh, out-of-body experiences uh, like uh, teleportation and, and those sorts of things. That, that's where we are. But what Maria Cornell is, is she is a, a devout, and this is about 16, let me see if I got my note right in front of me, about 1619, uh, I believe it is. Let's see, where is she at? I'm looking at my notes right here. Uh, boop, 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 boop. Oh, I had, where did I have her at? Okay, I'll say about 1619. But uh, she was, uh, she's devout when she's 18 years old. She is going to undergo a conversion, uh, a, a full conversion to full monastic Catholicism. She becomes a nun. Secondly, she comes from a devout family. It was said about her father uh, that her father would walk the halls of their palace or their castle there back in Spain carrying a 100-pound cross on his back as a form of uh, submission uh, to the ways of Christ and to punishment. A uh, very, very uh, hands-on religion, uh, a, a form of Catholicism there in Spain in the 1600s. So anyways, uh, here we are about 1619, going now to 1632. And that's so you get the idea in the time period. Maria Coronel is going to have a have moments and events where she she appears to be dead. I assume most of you have been to a funeral. Now, how shocking would it be if you were at a funeral and the person pops up out of the casket and says, "I'm not I'm not dead." I mean, most people would freak out, I assume, right? I assume that would, I'm trying to look at your reactions right now as I look around the screen, but I, you know, most people would freak out to say the least. It would not be a, a it would be an interesting development. Maria Cornell, what she does is, is that she was, uh, she will go into trances for two, three, four, and five days where she appears to be dead. And so how do you check somebody's, uh, uh, Life, you check their pulse, right? You check their, you know, do they uh, breathe? Do they fog up a mirror? Those sorts of things there. Those basic sorts of material. Well, she passed those tests that she was dead. She was deceased. But she was even taken uh, the way the one version of her first uh, uh, entranced encounter goes. She was put, she was going to be buried. She was at her own funeral. And she comes up out of the casket, so to speak. And she was like, what, what's happening here? What is happening is, is that Maria Cornell is uh, going to claim, and there is, uh, pr I guess you could say, evidence on this side of the Atlantic Ocean to back up that claim, that she uh, will be tr uh, teleported in the middle from her trance, and she will be teleported, I say, that's, a, that's like a Star Trek type of term, but she will be taken to New Mexico and in parts of East Texas, and there she will be spreading the uh, good news of the gospel to the Native Americans in the Sangria de Cristo Mountains in New Mexico uh, and amongst the Caddo in East Texas. The reason we can say that uh, there is evidence on this side of the ocean, whether you believe it or not, it's another story, is that you will see these, uh, these missionaries who are working in and around Santa Fe, New Mexico, say there was a visitor in blue who taught us the rudiments of the Catholic faith and told us to go find priests and be baptized. And the way they described this visitor in blue, they described her as an apparition. And that fact of the matter is they said also that she would look, she was a woman. And they, the way they described her fit the, to a T Maria Cornell. She will be investigated. The inquisition, the Spanish inquisition, which could be very, very aggressive in its, uh, in, in its work will investigate her. And they think that she was uh, telling the truth. But we, it will say this, it will have a positive, at least for a period of time in the mid-1600s, it will have a positive impact on the Spanish mission efforts in and around Santa Fe, New Mexico. But one of the tribes I did mention with Maria Cornell, uh, just that little brief snippet of her story, is the, is the tribe, the Caddo Indians of East Texas. 
Uh, in fact, actually, go ahead and put the Cadawans in your notes. Let's go ahead and get them out of the way. The Cadawans of East Texas are probably the most um, advanced and most, uh, um, I would say advanced, probably about the best word for it, most advanced of the tribes of Texas. The Caddoans, some of you have been up in East Texas, there's a naturally occurring lake called Caddo Lake. Uh, some of you have been fishing there perhaps, others have been camping. The Caddoans in East Texas, when I say East Texas, they actually range into Louisiana, into Arkansas, uh, into Oklahoma, the, basically the Arklatex uh, territory. They're all through there. You find the Caddoans as far east as the Mississippi River trading with the Natchez Indians. You'll see them as far west, the Caddoans that is. You'll see them all the way out to New Mexico. These guys, these Caddoans, are uh, traders. They are farmers. And the reason we say that they're advanced, please put this in your notes, is, is that the Caddoans, they have several marks of modernity. They have several aspects that, are, that differentiate themselves, say, from the Karankawa Indians or the Qualitikans or some of those other tribes you'll read about in your textbook. But the thing about the, uh, the Caddoans is that they sleep up off the ground. If you want to get an idea about how far along a group of people are is how do they sleep. Do they sleep off the ground? If all you can do is sleep on the ground, that is an indication of uh, some sort of uh, the, that you're poor or, you, or you're, you haven't advanced too far. Secondly, not only do they do that, they don't move around a whole lot. They're very uh, locked into places. They, they're not nomadic like, say, the Karankawa were to some degree, the Qualitikans, the Comanches, uh, and so on. They are very much uh, planted in their territory. Uh, thirdly, they have permanent structures. They have permanent architectural stru structures, a dome-like uh, sleeping arrangements, which would ho uh, house 8, 10, 12, 15 people. Uh, and even they, like some of you, may have dogs uh, that sleep with you in the nighttime or a cat that sleeps with you in the evening. The fact of the matter is they let their animals sleep with them as well. So they're very advanced in that sense. Uh, they're not, they hunt, but they're not hunter and gatherers. They are much more farming related. So you'll see that. And for the, before smallpox hurt them really badly and other European diseases, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of Caddoans in a related groups throughout the Arklatec region. And it was even said about the Caddoans, they cut an interesting figure. Number one is their appearance. Please uh, mark note of that. They were prone to tattooing. But uh, as uh, many people may get tattoos nowadays, I have yet to see too many tattoos that go around the eyes. I, I, I don't know, does anybody know somebody who's tattooed around the eye or on the face or whatever? Okay, some of you are like, yeah, I do. Uh, oftentimes, I'll be honest about it, if I see that, I make an assumption, perhaps wrongly, but a lot of times if you see somebody who's tattooed with it on the face, it's, they might have been in prison. But the thing is, is that uh, maybe they haven't. It depends because tattooing is very common nowadays. But for them, they tattooed around their eyes. So, uh, some Europeans, particularly Frenchmen, kind of referred to them as uh, uh, raccoon uh, appearance. Secondly, they were a big uh, believer in, uh, I, I would say, manipulating. That's uh, probably the polite way to say it. But certainly adjusting the body, uh, distorting the natural appearance of the body in a in a in a forced sort of way much like if you talk about the uh, say uh, in times w well gone by say uh, the uh, chinese would tie the and bind up the feet of the girls have you all ever heard about that before okay that that sort of idea and i don't remember the name of the tribe i've seen it over the years in national geographic magazine and others where the uh, these different uh, tribes uh, I believe it's it's african as i recall i couldn't tell you where or who but they stacked the rings up and they stretched the neck You've perhaps seen that before as well, okay? Uh, that sort of dis uh, distortion is what we're talking about. In the case of the Catalans, they would put a, uh, a helmet. I'll, I'll, I'll use the term helmet, though I don't really mean it to look like a football player's helmet. But they would put a device on the head of a kid, male or female. And what it would do is it would force the skull to grow back and out. And it was so like a scoop vent on a Trans Am sort of thing. Uh, so if you want to think about that. So when you saw them, they cut quite the figure. Oh, one of the things is, is that they often cried. They were big criers. They loved to cry. Hello, 
Good. It, well, not only, I mean, just think about it. When you were a kid, your grandparents were leaving to go back home and they'd stayed with you a week and you didn't want them to go and you broke out into tears, tears of sorrow. We all get that. When they said hello, they cried. When they said goodbye, they cried. When somebody died, they cried. And when they were about to kill somebody, they cried. It was known about the Catawans that if they were about to go, uh, it was uh, kind of a warning amongst the French, who did a lot of trading with the Catawans, that if you see a bunch of Catawan women start to cry, you better uh, be a little careful because you might be the one, uh, you might be uh, about to be uh, slaughtered. But the Catawans, uh, they were tradesmen. That's really the thing to keep in mind about them. They were tradesmen, and they were tradesmen. Uh, one other thing, too, that was uh, kind of unique to my knowledge uh, amongst the Texas Indians is they put a emphasis on girls. And more particularly, unlike, say, the Qualitikans who killed their little girls uh, quite a bit, actually, the Catawans, they allowed women to be queens, to be leaders. Uh, in fact, there's only one county in Texas named for a woman. Does anybody know what that name of that county is? Just curious, I'll, I'll ask. But anyways, uh, if you, it's Angelina, and i got to remember I'm recording, so I can't uh, quite do the interactive stuff I normally would. But it's Angelina County in East Texas. Angelina, write her name down. Angelina County is the only county in Texas out of 254 named for a woman. All the other counties in Texas are named for uh, geographical or geological formations or, or guys. But then there's Angelina. Angelina was... Uh, this will be about the turn about 1700, 1690, 1700 territory. Angelina was a Catawan prince princess. She is really one of the great and more interesting characters you come across in the late night, the late eight. Let me think a second here. Late 17th and early 18th century in Texas history. She is going to be swept up in the Spanish uh, missionary efforts. She will be sent to Mexico to be taught Spanish. She's smart. Oh, she's brilliant, frankly. Angelina is a heck of a, uh, of, a, of, a spe of a leader. She speaks Spanish. She speaks French. She speaks, uh, I don't think she spoke English. She spoke all the major dialects there in, East, in the Arklatex region, and she will become a queen amongst some of the tribes there in East Texas, Queen Angelina. Put this in your notes, and this is something the Spanish rarely said about a woman, is, is that, especially a native woman, they called her a sagacious woman, a sagacious woman. And if, if the Spanish called you sagacious, that was a high compliment. Sagacious means a wise woman. Well, the one of the men that you'll see me bring into your notes in just a few minutes, I mean, here he is already, but uh, I'll really develop him more in a second, is a guy named Louis Jojuru Saint-Denis. That's a, he's a Frenchman. Uh, this is about 1715 when this story happens. We'll call him Saint-Denis. Louis Jojuru Saint-Denis, but Saint-Denis was a trader, and he traveled here, there, and everywhere throughout uh, the what we'd call the Southeastern Conference in, a, in athletic terminology. Saint-Denis and Angelina became very good friends. In about 1715, Saint-Denis goes to Angelina and says, one of my trader friends, one of my French traders, one of my friends, has been captured by a uh, tribe down along the Texas coast. Now, the Texas coast is my term, it's not his. But this tribe is called the Atacapans. These guys are around the Beaumont, Port Arthur region, and they've got my friend. Can you help me out? And Angelina says, sure. And she sends an emissary down to the Atacapans around Beaumont, Port Arthur, the Golden Triangle, and they say, and basically say to the, the Atacapans, you've got my queen Angelina's husband. Because one of the things worth noting, too, about Angelina and others like her within the Catalan Confederacy is they practice plural mar marriage, a.k.a. polygamy. They practice polygamy. But not the polygamy that you may think. It was female the single female and multiple males, that sort of polygamy. Angelina said, you've got my husband. I need him back. And the Atacapan said, and they could be warlike. The Atacapan said, oh, we're sorry. Send our regards and our regrets, and uh, we apologize to Queen Angelina. We're sorry. And they kind of tipped their hat to him. Uh, the Frenchman was eventually given his release, and everything was fine. Uh, but in East Texas, uh, she cut a big figure. 
Best we can tell about what happens to her, uh, Angelina that is, she's going to be killed like so many others in the European disease outbreaks. This case, probably uh, smallpox. But the French, the French. So let me stop my recording just for a second. Word button. But yeah, in, in, in East Texas, in the Arklamis, meaning Mississippi, Ark, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, like the Arklatex, all that region around the Mississippi River, the French are going to be, you find their fingerprints everywhere. If you've ever traveled through Louisiana especially, yes, I know you have the French influence down in South Louisiana, but we're not really worried about them so much. We're talking more about the French influence out of Mobile, Alabama, out of New Orleans, uh, which was founded about the time, it's about 1700 when we're talking. All that territory through there, you will find the French trading. It's worth remembering the French were never as interested in turning Indians into good Catholics or good settlers, but they were certainly interested in trading. The Cadouans love to trade. And so as we go, we talk about this, uh, this, this desire to trade. That will always be one of the major driving forces for the French. But the French are also looking to expand their way into Texas. René Robert Cavalier Sword de La Salle, 1685 to 1690 basically, is going to uh, put together a Fort St. Louis along the coast of Texas, a complete failure. But what he does is he, La Salle fails, but he draws the Spanish back in. He draws the Spanish back in for a period of time. Put this date in your notes, 1690. 1690, uh, about 1693, only for about two to three years, you will see the Spanish try to establish missions and presidios in East Texas to thwart French activity, and it ultimately fails. But as you may already start to notice when I talk about the Spanish in Texas, a lot of what I'm saying is, is it fails, it fails, it fails. That is a common theme uh, for us uh, in Spanish history. And so if you ever hear Spanish uh, Texas history talked about, you can almost always say it was a successful failure. Okay, uh, let's say Logan, uh, 1690, 1690, 1690. So uh, when the Spanish trying to establish missions in East Texas, the Cadawans are interested. What are the Cadawans of East Texas interested in? Well, they're interested in trade. Are the Cadawans interested in the Catholic Church? Not so much. So by the time uh, you get to 1692, 1693, the Cadawans basically have abandoned uh, San, uh, San Francisco de los Tejas, San Francisco of the Texans, as it were, and the Spanish pull back to the Rio Grande River and beyond. Texas is abandoned again. However, these next dates in your notes are kind of big. In fact, very important to us. On July 19th, 1714, July 19th, 1714, please put that date in your notes, uh, especially July 1714, the 19th, the gravy, I suppose, but the 1714 is big. Louis Sand uh, Louis Jojeru Saint Denis. Let me spell him right quick, right quick for your notes. L U I S. It's not Louis like the the king. Louis Saint Denis is going to come through East Texas and uh, sixteen. Excuse me, seventeen fourteen. Seventeen fourteen. So. Uh, he is going to, he as a trader, as a Frenchman, is going to travel through East Texas. And the problem he, Saint Denis, has is, is that East Texas is a Spanish province. It's fair to remember that anybody trespassing in Spain, trespassing in Spanish Texas, was liable to a capital punishment, was liable to a capital offense. Unlike today where you say what can get you uh, sent to the death chamber in Huntsville, well, uh, basically a double felony, uh, say robbing a liquor store and killing the clerk, that would be that. Murder for hire would be another uh, sort of thing. Uh, killing a cop would be a, a reason for a death penalty in the state of Texas. The Spanish were much more liberal-minded when it, liberal and I mean like willing to give it to people who just showed up at the wrong place. When it comes to the Spanish, when it comes to their administration of Texas, they didn't want visitors. But the French wanted to trade. And Saint Denis, to his credit, was able to speak really well to the Cadawans. And he explained to them, and the Cadawans wanted to trade too, but there was these legal barriers. 
So on July, what did I say? July 19th, 1714, in a presidio called San Juan Batista, uh, San Juan Batista, St. John the Baptist Presidio, on the Rio Grande, about four Frenchmen, including Saint Denis, and about four Catawans from East Texas came to San Juan Batista Presidio there on the Rio Grande. It, by the way, is close to today's Eagle Pass. And they come, and Saint Denis basically said, I was working with these uh, Catawans, and they said they want to become good Catholics. And the Spanish bit. The Spanish were interested. And so the Spanish will put Saint Denis under house arrest. Saint Denis, in the meantime, marries the, uh, the granddaughter of the, uh, the Presidio Post. And Saint Denis is going to be released. And this is a major turning point right here. 1717, excuse me, 1716, you're going to see missions and presidios established in East Texas around today's San Augustine, around today's Nacogdoches, around today's Marshall, around today's Natchitoches, Louisiana. In fact, the Spanish claim to Texas goes beyond the Sabine River all the way into western Louisiana. The first capital of Texas will be established in about 1717, and that capital's name is Los Adais. So if you ever ask what is the first capital of Texas, it is not San Antonio. It is that little town right there, Los Adais. I say it's a town, it's really a mission. But the Mission Presidio Complex in East Texas is going to be established after San Denis makes contact with the Spanish, and he brings them back. Now, have any of you ever driven... Let me hit the uh, pause button right quick for a second. And when you travel from East Texas to the Rio Grande, the problem you run into is, is that this so far from San Juan Batista on the Rio Grande to Los Adais in western, uh, today's western Louisiana, you have such a big gap, you are just exposed. You can be attacked. It's, it's a real pain. So that's where we come to the next uh, point. This next date is an extraordinarily important one as well. Uh, let me see if I've got it written down here. Ah, yes, I do. May Day, May 1st, 1718. May 1st, 1718. It is the founding of San Antonio. The reason we spend time talking about these obscure, seemingly obscure Frenchmen like uh, Saint Denis or those who were going to East Texas and, and setting up missions that ultimately fail because the Catalans are not going to accept uh, Christianity and become good taxpayers uh, like they, the Catholics had hoped, is because you see the establishment of permanent settlements in Texas. In this case, on May 1st, 1718, it is the city of San Antonio. You're going to not start with San Antonio. It's going to be Mission, uh, uh, Mission San Antonio de Valero. Let me write that in your notes. If you've gotten gas at a Valero station off of 29th Street, that is named for that, San Antonio de Valero. San Antonio is the patron saint of the mission. Valero is the governor of Spain, New Spain. That's where he comes in. So that's where that name comes in. And then also, the next up is, is that shortly thereafter, meaning like within the next year, you're going to see the presidio that comes al alongside of it. Excuse me a second. Presidio, Presidio de Bayar. And eventually, right after that, Villa de Bayar. Why do they pick that region right there? Well, number one, it has lots and lots of good water and good limestone and things you can build with. Uh, it is quite, uh, set, uh, it's quite good to settle. It's about a halfway point between East Texas and the Rio Grande. All those things put together, San Antonio becomes a, an established city. And before it's all said and done, yeah, Villa de Bejar, yeah. The thing is, all before it's all said and done, San Antonio will be the major settlement in Spanish Texas and even in Mexican Texas. This is establishing one of the major, the first real major settlement in Texas that sticks. 1719, and let's go ahead and finish this uh, lecture up with this story right here. 1719. You can call this little uh, event in your notes. You can call it the Great Chicken War of 1719. 
Now, I don't know if any of you ever had an uh, aunt or uncle, grandfather, grandmother that decided, you know what, we want to get back into uh, nature. We don't want to do it like uh, modern society does, and we want to grow chickens. Um, I've never had that desire. Maybe y'all have, and it's, it's an interesting affair. I don't know if anybody enjoys f- feeding chickens. I've done it once or twice. didn't do anything for me. It's a lot easier to go down to HEB and buy them. But uh, Losa Dice by 1719, Losa Dice by 1719, is already in bad shape. The capital of Texas was was nearly empty. You had, put this in your notes, at Los Dice in 1719 in western Louisiana, you have all of one Catholic priest and one soldado. That's all who's there. The Cadawans never really came, and what Indians that were not Cadawan that might have stayed there, they ran away. In 1719, France and Spain was at war again, and that is a common theme in European history. France and Spain at war. In the French settlement of Natchitoches, Louisiana, Natchitoches is spelled, uh, let's see, N-A-T, N-A-T-C-H-I-T-O-C-H-E-S. It's pronounced Natchitoches, though it might look like Natchitoches. It's Natchitoches, Louisiana. In the, in the French settlement of Natchitoches, Louisiana, in 1719, in, uh, I believe it was in August, I believe it, I believe it was August, but this uh, French captain, along with some of his command, were sitting in a bar a, and drinking cold drinks, as my grandmother used to say, cold drinks to the glory of uh, France, cold drinks to the glory of the king of France, King Louis XIV, I believe it was. And they start talking. And some of you know exactly what happens when men who have alcohol then start doing this. Oh, I I assume some of you have seen men get a little puffed up in pride, strong, and, you know, I can do this, I can do that. Somebody jumps off the uh, uh, railing. Question? Somebody will jump off a railing, perhaps. Wilson, you got a question? I had With the uh, With the chicken war, as it was called, Captain Blondel, B-L-O-N-D-E-L, Captain Blondel, who was a Frenchman, got a little drunk one night, and he and his fellow, fellow soldiers started talking about the glories of France as opposed to the glories or lack thereof or the Spanish. And these men, probably about 50 of them roughly, decided that they should do something and strike a blow for France. They crossed the neutral boundary, the neutral, which is the, uh, an arroyo, and they go and they attack Los Dice in the middle of the night. These Frenchmen are drunk, and they stayed drunk during the assault. When they got there, they rousted the Catholic priest out of his bed, tied him up to a tree. They uh, they roped the soldado and tied him up, and that was that. They had sacked the Texas capital. But in the process of sacking the capital of Texas, they noticed that there were a bunch of hen houses around Los Dice. And these Frenchmen had become hungry, and so they went after the hen houses. The feathers flew, pun intended, and while the feathers flew and these drunken Frenchmen were chasing chickens, the Catholic priest and this soldado got away and ran off in the nighttime. They ran to, east, to the other presidios and missions of East Texas and announced that the, Spa- the French were in force and were attacking East Texas. What this does, and this is why it's called the Great Chicken War of 1719, is because what it does is it causes the Spanish to leave East Texas, and they move many of those missions, most of those missions, in fact, back to San Antonio. So if you're from San Antonio and you've ever been on a tour, not just of San Antonio de Valero, which is the Alamo to us, but you also know there's San, uh, San uh, Juan Capistrano, Mission San Jose, and on we can go. There are other missions along the river. Many of those missions were removed from East Texas and brought to San Antonio. This makes San Antonio a bigger and more important settlement. In fact, actually, for almost the entirety of Spanish history in Texas, if there was a governor of the province of Texas, he lived not at the capital at Los Adais, which was not abandoned until later, but he lives in San Antonio. That's why San Antonio matters, and all these little nuggets come into view. San Antonio begins to grow, and San Antonio becomes the settlement in East Texas. 
me just say this before I stop the lecture and uh, we pick up uh, next time and I start recording things. Uh, it's important to remember that Texas at its height prior to the Mexican Revolution of 1810, Texas at its height, put this in your notes, had about 25,000 people living in it. After the revolution, it's a lot less. We'll talk more about that uh, in later times. So anyhow, uh, 1257, that's a good place to stop, 